my glasses because I was crying and now y'all are fuzzy. <laughs> Good morning again. God bless you. Welcome to Abundant Life Church. We have Mrs. Sharon bringing her second part of As in the Days of Noah this morning to us. We know that you are a very special group and you're willing to go through this study. This defies everything that's been painted for us in history since the early 1900s. It's absolutely not su uh, supported by Satan's agenda at all. <laughs> That's why God wants this body of Christ to be equipped for his second coming, because it's not going to be automatic. The lesson that you're receiving today is a big lesson. We cannot cover it word for word during a service. Okay, so don't panic when you see how many pages there are. I want you to have the evidence of the giants and of what's happened in the earth in your possession so that when people talk to you about the Stone Age, uh, ape men, you can just sort of chuckle and say, you know what, I've got something to show you. So that's where we're at, equipping the saints. Does everybody have, everybody, even if you're a kid, you're going to want one because there are pictures in there, in color, so, for goodness sake. So don't think, I don't need that today. You need it. Everybody. Okay. Sir Isaac Newton uh, said this, and I thought this was profound. About the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. I can testify that the resources that I have been studying for this lesson and for this whole series, have, God has raised up godly men to, to study this and to research it amid much opposition. That time is now. Isaiah 13, 1 through 3 says, Open the gates, you ruler. I give command and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. For behold, the day of the Lord is coming, which cannot be escaped a day of wrath and anger to make the world desolate. And Babylon shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited. Monsters shall rest there. Devils shall dance there. Satyrs shall dwell there. But against the church, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Jesus of Nazareth. Examples of demons in the Bible appear in Isaiah where the prophet writes of demons who have a strange mix of animal and human characteristics. Remember last time we talked about the fallen angels impregnating human women and out of them came the giants. And, and when they did that with, with animals and whatever, they, they end up with these monsters of animal, human, fallen angel cup that, that all of history's Fallen gods and fairy tales are made out of. <clears throat> Isaiah says, The wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl shall also rest there and find her for herself a place of rest. The word for owl is mistranslated. A satyr is portrayed as having a human head, torso, and arms with the hind legs of a goat and goat horns, and it has an insatiable sexual appetite. I'm on page two. Obviously, we're skipping stuff, okay? Top of page two. Isaiah wrote about a demon-like creature that mixed animal and human characteristics. A second demon mentioned is the mistranslated owl, which should actually be translated as night demon. Isaiah did not aim to write owl, but rather used the Hebrew word lilith a female demon associated by, Hebrew, by the Hebrews with evil things. 
the Jewish rabbis named seven tribes of giants found in the Bible and commented about each. Nephilim, obsession over the nape of the neck, violent or fallen ones, they caused the world to fall and fill themselves. In other words, they were eating people. Rephraim means dead because their sight made people fearful and melt like wax. Example of Goliath of Gath and his brothers. There's also research done on that meaning of, of Rephraim for death. It means they will not be resurrected. Anakim, sons of Anak, because they wore huge necklaces and great numbers. Zemzemin, because they were great warriors and inspired fear. Emim, because of their great size, whoever saw one was seized with terror. Giburim, because their brains, their cranium were large. Avim, because they destroyed the world and were themselves destroyed. The im at the end of the names means it's plural. So we're going to look at their ancient technology. The size and scope of David Fling's discovery of the geoliths simply surpasses comprehension. Mammoth traces of intelligence are carved in stone and cover hundreds of square miles. I'm at the last paragraph there. David Fling found gigantic repetitive shift shapes of interlocking rectangular and circular cells of raised mounds and lines that form a continuous strip. Some of the lines are actually carved into the layers at different depths, creating multicolor shapes. The geoliths extend over 100 miles south of the Mayan Desert. We're on page three. That picture that you have there that should also be on the screen, we need the light off. I'm sorry, but that's not going to be good enough. This is something you can only see from the air. There, that's better. All of this is carved out. Many of the carvings around Tiwanaku appear to be intentionally arranged in a set of configurations like a written language imprinted on the earth. The watches taught the giants, their sons, uh, the forbidden secrets of heaven. They taught them to work with the metals of the earth, to work with megalithic stones, how to cut, move, and mold them. They taught them astrology and cosmology, the movements of the planets and the stars, sorcery to control the powers of nature, to give wives a drink that would render them barren in order that they might retain their figure so that their beautiful appearance might not fade and the earth was filled with wickedness. Megalithic literally means giant stone. There are hundreds of sites with megalithic stone circles, walls, and structures that date back several thousand years. The stonework is so massive and precise that even with the use of sophisticated modern technology, it is impossible to duplicate. We're going to go on, on page four, underneath the pictures of the pyramids. By 2008, 138 pyramids had been discovered in Egypt. The stones are accurately aligned with the points of a compass. There's only two hundredth of an inch spacing between the 100-ton ton stones. Under such massive weight, structures normally sink slowly into the ground. Modern buildings settle at an average rate of six inches per 100 years. And there should be a picture really, really soon on the things that are sinking. Is there a next one? There we go. Yet, in the last 5,000 years, the Great Pyramid, which weighs approximately 6 million tons, has settled less than one half inch. The blocks on each side of the pyramid are at the same level, and they are equally level all the way to the top. We're moving to the top of page five. A pilot flew over the Pyramid of Giza and discovered that the pyramid has eight sides instead of four. The eight sides can only be clearly seen from the air during the dawn and sunset of the spring and autumn equinox when the sun casts shadows on the slightly concave sides. Located close to the pyramids is the Sphinx, the largest monolithic structure in the world. The Sphinx is over 60 feet in height and 240 feet in length, and it is carved from a single piece of limestone. The Temple of Karnak is a temple that defies explanation. The columns are indescribable. The most impressive attribute of the temple is the carved hieroglyphics on the obelisk. The symbols were engraved on granite as if they were done by a machine. The bottoms of the cuts appear to have been made by a rotating tool. Across from the temple of Karnak, on the other side of the Nile, are two massive monolithic statues, Colossi of Menon, each carved from a single block of stone weighing an estimated 1,000 tons. The statues were quarried near modern-day Cairo 
and transported 420 miles over land without using the Nile. Then there's some things about the pyramid. I'm not looking at that today. Turn on page six under more megalithic mysteries. Every single continent has megalithic stone monuments with blocks that weigh more than 125 tons. Thousands of these structures and stones have been placed all around the world. The idea of primitive people being the architects and creators of these projects is erroneous and ludicrous. Pumapunka in Bolivia. The ruins of Pumapunka display megalithic granite blocks, which are among the largest found on the planet. They reach over 25 feet in length and weigh over 100 tons. They are precision cut, smoothly polished, held together with metal clamps and sockets and artistically decorated. The lines cut into these rocks are precisely the same depth and exactly the same distance apart. The stone is granite or diorite, both just about as hard as a diamond. Next little paragraph. Some of the stones weigh hundreds of tons. The stones were mined over 60 miles away. The elevation is, is 12,000 feet. There are no trees above that level for rolling the stones on logs. Even more amazing are the H blocks. Each H block was carved from a single stone. There are no chisel marks on the blocks. They are made to interlock with one another like pieces of an elaborate puzzle. We're on page seven. The Inca fortress of Sacriuma is located above Cusco, Peru. Next paragraph. It's built out of huge stone blocks and is a 1,500 feet long and 54 feet wide and it's the largest stone and, 20, and it's 28 feet high. One block is cut to fit perfectly with 12 other blocks. They appear to have been molded together like putty, yet there's no mortar used in the construction. Next page, page eight. Another enigma in South America is the mysterious Nazca lines in the Peruvian desert to the south. The Nazca lines are massive carvings or drawings on the landscape of the desert that are scattered over nearly a 200 mile area. There are depictions of animals, birds, fish, insects, over 70 creatures. The largest creature is the size of nearly three football fields in length. There are over 800 straight lines and over 50 geometrical shapes. And it's only from the air that they can be seen or understood. That's what that picture is. We'll never see it personally. Get up there and see it. This is awesome. Central America, Mexico, not so well known are the stone orbs of Costa Rica and they are strewn across, strewn across the land. Known as the giant balls, the total count is well over 1,000 in number, with some of them weighing more than 16 tons and being over 10 feet in diameter. One of the largest balls has a diameter of six and a half feet and its circumference has only two tenths of 1% error in being a perfect sphere. In Europe, Bosnia, more than 40 stone balls have been discovered in Bosnia. The existence of the balls in this region was not known until the earthquake in the early 2000s revealed them. They vary in size with the largest measuring over five and a half feet. Page nine, the top. Dozens more stone balls have been found in Champ Island in Russia, which is located in the Arctic Ocean. They are perfectly round and dot the landscape where they are found. France has the largest collection of standing stones in the world with more than 3,000 that weigh up to 350 tons each and stand at a height of 65 feet. England's well-known Stonehenge is constructed of 40 to 50 ton megaliths with pins and sockets to hold the crossbars in place. Down near the bottom, Easter Island possesses nearly 1,000 large stone statues called mue. The largest ever erected statue in antiquity weighs in at over 80 tons. On its head is an 11.5 ton hat. The statue once stood at a height of nearly 38 feet, 10 meters. Next page, page 10. The giant is an unfinished massive statue still in the quarry and would stand over 70 feet in height, a six story building and weigh over 270 tons. This is equivalent to almost exactly what a giant Boeing airline would weigh fully loaded and fueled for takeoff. The legend of the islanders insists that the statues walked upright from the quarry to their final destination, aided by a mysterious supernatural force they call manna. A Stonehenge-like monument sits at the top of Israel's Golan Heights called Gilgal Rephaim, the circle of the Rephaim giants. 
It consists of five concentric stone rings whose diameter is more than 500 feet and consists of more than 40,000 stones totally some 37,500 metric tons. Next paragraph. The monument is located some 10 miles east of the Sea of Galilee in the middle of a large plateau, down a little ways. An aerial perspective is necessary to see the complete layout. It predates the pyramids and the Babylonian temples, which makes them the oldest astronomical complex in the Middle East. The southeast open, opening provided a direct view of Sirius as it rose above the horizon. It is the brightest star in the night sky. Interestingly, the Canaanites, that's where many of the giants were, had a connection with Sirius. The Sidonians called Mount Hermon Syrian. When we talk about stargates, we're going to talk more about Mount Hermon. That is coming up in another lesson. Shortly after the flood, cult towers and a host of other complexes were constructed by the ancients to worship the stars, sun, and planets. They are found all over the world. Why? Why were giants propagating the land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants? Top of page 11. It's becoming clear that after the flood, Satan was determined to keep the prophetic promise of the coming Messiah from being fulfilled. Apart from the Bible, the stone circles are the source of legends about a remnant of the giants, or Rephaim, who had a giant king named Og. There is a good evidence that the biblical giants, or Rephaim, were the architects and engineers who constructed the monument. In Genesis 14.5, we're told that the Rephaim inhabited the place called Ashtaroth Karnaim, which is just 10 miles from the rings and is the site of an ancient Canaanite city called Ashtaroth. In Joshua 12.4, we learn that King Og of Bashan, the last of the Rephaim who lived at Ashtaroth, ruled a territory that stretched from Mount Hermon in the north. In Deuteronomy 3, we're given the description of the size of King Og's bed, which measured nearly 14 feet long and 6 feet wide, which is what is on our floor. I would like to find somebody who will volunteer to lie down on King Og's bed. Oh, yes, Paul, we need you. Okay. He even has a pillow. Woo! Wow. How tall are you, Paul? Around 6 feet. Around 6 feet. Oh my goodness. Wow. Someone should take a picture of that. Oh my goodness. Somebody's trying to take a picture of it. Just pull your shirt a little bit and we're in business. This is awesome. This is awesome. It's an iron bed. There's about a foot of headroom above my head. Uh huh. This is amazing. And he was, he was, Small. I mean, the fallen angels before the flood, we're talking 30, 36 feet, some over 100 feet. We're, we're, we're talking that. But now it's been red and red and red and red, and poor King August is just has to sleep in a 14 foot long bed. Unbelievable. But it's believable, it's true. Okay. Uh, let's see. We're on number four. If First Chronicle, in 1 Chronicles 20, the last of the Anakim were killed, and these giants were descendants of the giants of Gath and were killed by David and his soldiers. And number six there, the Jewish oral tradition says, Og, the king of Bashan, descended from the Nephilim, who were deities who fell from the heavens. Og had children who were hybrid giants called the Anakim or Rephaim. It seems apparent that giants were involved in the construction of the stone circles, known as the circles of Rephaim. The purpose of God was to plant the nation of Israel in the land God called my land. Satan's counter plan was to have his giants propagate the land of Israel in order to prevent the Jewish people from possessing the land. Satan planted giants in the land in order to maintain control of his abducted earth. Turn the page, we're on page 12. When Abraham entered Canaan, we read in Genesis 12, 6 that the Canaanite was already in the land. Caesarea Philippi. The city of Caesarea Philippi is located in northern Israel, and it's located near a massive rock wall well over 100 feet straight up and about 500 feet wide. Harold and I visited that site when we were in Israel, and it was astounding to me how large it was and that Jesus chose that spot to ask the question that we're going to look at. This site was the location of several temples dedicated to Roman and Hellenistic gods, Pan, Zeus, Dionysus, and Artemis. The city of Caesarea Philippi was built on top of this enormous rock 
to give honor to the gods, Caesar and Pan. Jesus used a city on a hilltop as an example to the disciples. He was right there standing at the foot of this massive rock with the city of Caesarea Philippi on top of that rock. And he says to the disciples, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Flowing out of this rock is a freshwater spring, the main source of water that feeds into the Sea of Galilee. The water originates from a grotto named after God Pan. Pan, the half man, half goat, god of fright or panic, is often depicted playing the flute. He was the god of sexual perversion, involving himself in lewd activities. The grotto was a center of pagan worship to the fertility gods. Next paragraph. The pagans living in the area thought the grotto created a stargate. We're going to talk about stargates probably next time. A gateway to the underworld, to Sheol, Hades, Tar Tartarus, where the fertility gods lived. At this location, people committed wicked acts of worship, immorality of all kinds. Jesus chose this place to ask Peter this most important question. Who do you say that I am? It was at Caesarea Philippi where Jesus proclaimed that he would build his church. Here he declared that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. <clears throat> Jude 6 and 7, the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged, left their habitat. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. They're coming again. Next paragraph. Seven times in Exodus 19, God mentions boundaries around Mount Sinai that the Israelites were not to cross. Crossing the boundaries meant death. Obviously, the angels were also well aware of the boundaries and limits God had set for them. Peter calls the place where these angels are being held as Tartarus, and he ties it to the flood of Noah's day. He says, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to Tartarus, putting them into days of darkness to be held for judgment. Tartarus only appears in this one place in the Greek New Testament. The Greek term Tartarus is referred to as a pit of darkness in the unseen world. Next paragraph. Tartarus is neither Sheol of the Old Testament nor Hades of the New Testament. It is not Gehenna or Hell, but the place where certain angels are confined reserved unto judgment. This punishment for these angels is because of their special sin. Very last sentence on that page. It would be like a place comparable to where nuclear waste is deposited far away from anything that could be contaminated by it. And we are now on page 14. <clears throat> Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle against principalities, against powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The word for rulers is arche, and it's plural. It means... Its meaning indicates more than one ruler and more likely a group of rulers. It literally means one who was in the beginning or the preeminent one. But because it's plural, it means those entities who were there from the beginning who came first. The word for powers is exousia, and it means to have authority to act. Darkness of this world is better translated world forces of darkness. It literally means ruler of this world, but again, since we're dealing with a plural, it means a group of evil, dark rulers, kind of like demonic cabal. The Apostle Paul is telling us here that there is a literal fallen angel, shadow cabal, who has been granted the authority to act on earth against God's creation. In essence, mankind is on center stage, and evil is being orchestrated against us by fallen angel overlords who rule this planet. That ancient evil is rising at the end of the age as the Bible said it would. We've entered into a new season, a new time, the end times where everything has changed. The spiritual battle that has been unseen for centuries is becoming seen in our 3D reality. Evil is becoming bolder because Satan knows that his time is short. God's protection will become more apparent. It will take the power of God to even keep us alive. Matthew 24 says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall be. And unless those days be cut short, should no flesh be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. Guess what? The elect is us. The elect are the believers. They are not out of the world yet. This is serious stuff. Most, most churches are believing that you're not going to go through any kind of tribulation. I'm sorry, that's not scriptural. 
That's so dangerous because Christians who believe that, when it gets as bad as Jesus says it's going to be, they're going to be looking for a new Christ that's going to save them, and the fallen angels will be right there to do it. This is so critical, y'all. That ancient, well, we've done that already. We don't have to say that again. God has not left us defenseless. And providing his people defensive and offensive weapons, he's basically telling us that we must also fight in this battle and not expect him to do all the work when it comes to our protection. Otherwise, he wouldn't be giving us these weapons. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is the language of war. Like it or not, we're in the fight already. Will we simply be target practice for the enemy's fiery darts or will we inflict pain right back at the devil and his hordes? Page 15. The Holy Spirit reveals the enemy's plans before they can be executed so that we can be on the offensive instead of only reacting from a defensive position. That's what this whole series is about, telling us ahead of time before it starts happening. Demons and other entities are not confined to our physical plane. They also exist in the supernatural realm, which we cannot see without the help of the Holy Spirit. They can interact with us without our ever knowing that they did so. They can whisper in our ears and we can think that that thought was just our own. Without taking action against it, we may even find ourselves defending and propagating the demonic idea. Forerunners of the Apollon. Symbols of the gods. The ancients believed in the demigods of the mythological world, but haven't we evolved beyond the cult of hybrid demigods? Apparently not. We have named our planets days of the week and months of the year after the Nephilim. Europe is named after the Greek god Europa, and our Atlantic Ocean is named after Atlas the Nephilim. America was named Americapana, shortened to America by the natives. Amaru means serpent, or literally Quetzalcoatl. Ka means regions or lands. So the meaning of America is land of the serpent, or more precisely, land of Quetzalcoatl. We have also named many chemicals after these strange creatures of the past. You have a list of there. It's not exhaustive. Page 15. I'm turning to page 16. Branding the Nephilim. On every Starbucks cup, there's a picture of a hybrid of the Nephilim. A siren, a mermaid who is half fish, half woman, a hybrid. Sirens were said to have, sailors, have, have lured sailors to their deaths with their songs. Starbucks simply copied a 15th century Syrian. Over time, they have used a little bit of artistic imagination to slightly change the, the image. Does that mean you can't drink, drink co Starbucks coffee? It does not, but you sure better know where it's been coming from. The Olympics. It's named after the Olympian gods who defeated the Titans and ruled from Mount Olympus. This event was a tribute to the Nephilim. The logo Nike is a sports brand with sporting goods. Nike is the goddess of victory, is another one of the Nephilim. You can see this goddess engraved in stone at Ephesus in Turkey. How about Odyssey? You might be thinking a car by Honda? No. Odyssey is a Greek epic about the ancient Nephilim. How about Versace, an Italian symbol of the most luxurious brand? She's a woman with a head of snakes who turns its victims into stone. She's a hybrid of the Nephilim. What about Amazon.com? I use it regularly. I will, until it's no longer available. The Amazons were supposedly a race of female warriors whose name meant without breasts. They were hybrids of Ares and Mars, and these Nephilim would cut off one or both of their breasts so that they could fight more viciously. They were feared everywhere. The Achilles heel is a tendon named after the demigod Achilles, who was a hybrid son of the goddess Thetis and Peleus, a friend of Hercules. Today, a person's weaknesses are called his Achilles heel. Hollywood loves the Nephilim. <laughs> it loves the demigods. Go to the bottom, next part of that paragraph, the movie entitled, When Aliens Come, What Do They Want? 
suggests that they want human genes for manipulation. We'll see that when we get to the UFO stuff. The hybrids want to make genetically modified organisms. Right now, all of this is in the realm of science fiction. Dr. Dennis Lindsay, Christ for the Nation, says, I maintain that these science fiction creatures are actually preparing our world to accept the real thing. Inspired by Satan, these hybrids and alien beings are definitely on the horizon, and I believe will soon be in our midst. The subject of aliens has become a real world issue. Governments are spending billions of dollars on the search for extraterrestrial life. Why are they looking for that? They do not want to submit to the true God. According to an estimate of page 17, the Government Accountability Office, the federal government wasted approximately $247 billion in taxpayer money in 2023 in the search of extraterrestri extraterrestrial life. Thank you very much, government, yeah. for taking our taxes to waste like this. First Timothy 4.1 says the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and will follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. We're going to be seeing that. We're already hearing about that, especially when we get to the UFO conspiracy stuff. It's actually happening now in our time, y'all. The Catholic Church is working really hard at redefining the gospel so that when aliens come, they can be baptized and they will teach us their religion. We will get into that. That is not fun. Oh, Lord Jesus. Jesus warned that Christ, false Christs and false prophets will appear to deceive even the elect. That's us, y'all. In the days before Jesus returns, we can expect many visitors who will claim to be from other dimensions, galaxies, and places unknown, who have words of wisdom, knowledge, and power, and who will be able to perform amazing signs and wonders. They are from the liar who has no truth in him. And I put that verse down lower, and I, we got a double if you got that copy. But anyway, middle of this page, on page 17. We think of sin as separate types of acts, but the very nature of sin is the power of rebellion transmitted from the fallen angels and genetically introduced into fallen man's genome. Sin is a power, not just an act. With our own strength and wisdom, we cannot outguess, outfight, outthink, or outmaneuver the devil. It can't be done. Our victory comes from standing in faith, trusting and knowing that it is God, the Lord of heaven's armies, who fights for us. We are in him, and he is in us. In Amos 4, the name that God has given there is Lord God of hosts. 1 John 2, 22 to 23 says, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? We're going to be hearing that more and more and more and more and more. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. We have not met the Antichrist, but as, as the Apostle John said years and years ago, that spirit of Antichrist has already been among us all this time. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. One who confesses the Son has the Father also. Stephen Quayle, who is a Christian who has done so much research, at least over 40 years of flying around in the plains, look, checking on all these megaliths, and look, interviewing ancestors from the of the giants, this is his final conclusion. God often uses his people in naturally supernatural ways. When we purpose to walk with him one step at a time and are obedient, one day we will look back at our lives and see miracles. Those miracles are a result of our being obedient when we hear him say, go to the left or go to the right. It's a matter of obedience, and it's in our obedience that we find his protection. You do your part, and God will do his. For me and for you, God's protection is ultimately Jesus. Amen and amen. I'm going to open it up just a little bit for any kind of reactions. Are you still breathing? <laughs> what should I do? Yes. I don't know what you're saying. Yes, the Nephilim that died, they are the evil spirits. 
And if we go to some sources like Enoch, the book of Enoch, he was, remember, he's one of the few that went to heaven without dying. When you look in his stuff, which actually uh, the early church very much appreciated the book of Enoch. Uh, obviously, when we're accessing any kind of, the, of these old, old resources that have passed on, passed on, uh, we have to always check with scripture. But Enoch is very clear about the future of the Nephilim, that they, the fallen angels who died, the ones who are caused all this trouble, they are already in a kind of a prison until they're released, okay? But they're, they're what should we call them? Their children, the Rephaim, the Nephilim, they died physically, but their spirit didn't go anywhere because they are mixed. They can't, they're not, heaven's not their home, earth's not their home, hell's not their home at this point. So that has been labeled as the demonic spirits that we deal with today. That's not very comforting. <laughs> In America, oh my goodness. And I would say the majority of people don't believe that, that Satan exists, and they don't believe that there are any demons at all. I can tell you, growing up in Madagascar, they are very real. And they're not pretty. And they're awful. And nobody wants them. But when you get to America, they're all sophisticated. They're in your medicine sometimes, the name. Or they're in, they're, they're, they're just everywhere. Looking really good. It's interesting that uh, I kind of feel reluctant to learn all this, but, sure. but at the same time, it's mind-boggling that I'm willing to look into like, uh, like fantasy movies and stories with like uh, the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And it's, although it's, it's fantastical, it's full, it's, of, it's full of the hybrids. Yeah. And right now, and that's what that statement is, I don't know which page it was, but right now that's in the area of science fiction. But it's preparing us for the real thing when it happens. So I don't, I don't believe that God, yes, absolutely. I don't believe God's saying you can't enjoy those whatever. That's between you and God how you do that. Some are great and some are not and whatever. I am not here to do that. But he, we are being prepared. We've been brainwashed for a long, long time. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. I just want to share a uh, personal experience that I had, you know, back in Guam. Okay. You know, and uh, <clears throat> I also like to tie in God's protection is ultimately Jesus, which you just shared. Mm -hmm. So this was a supernatural experience. I had just gotten off from an uh, overnight shift, went home to go sleep, laid down in my bed, and in the spirit, the beast came. Mm. And what I can tell you all is that, you know, he was ugly, he was black, mm -hmm. and everything. And what he did to me was because I was afraid I tried to open my mouth to say the name of Jesus. And you couldn't go back. And I could not. Yeah. What he didn't know is that I could say it through my mind. Yeah, praise God. And I did. The moment he did, I did that, guess what? He released me, or I was released. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, for me personally, as I you know, continued to grow in the kingdom, I knew what the name of Jesus meant, yes. even though you can't physically say it. God gave it, you know, we're in that class in there and we're studying about the brain. Yes. Be thankful that God created us like the way he did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Our brain, you know, even though we can't say it uh, consciously, mm -hmm. he gives us the ability to say it yes. subconsciously. Mm -hmm. And I just want to share that with y'all. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, when you were talking about those demons right away, I thought of Legion. He yes. went into all those hogs and they went down the hill. Where did Legion go? 
to the pigs. Uh, hello. The pigs are smarter than most yeah. people. They could not stand <laughs> to stay alive with those demons yeah. in them. It's yeah. just flood of here. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but praise God, I like the word, and the word gives us victory. Hallelujah. Yes, and this is talking about Jesus, who's our shepherd. And he says, he that enters in by the door of the shepherd of the, of the sheep, sheep, to him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And he puts, them, he puts forth his own sheep, and he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know yeah, his voice. His voice. Yes. So that's, a, that's our responsibility that's to right. know what God's word says. That's Glory right. to God. That's, and a stranger, a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of a stranger. I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Then he remembers to, to remind you, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Yeah, Hallelujah. Is in him. I am the good Amen. shepherd and know my sheep. Yeah. And we can't go farther than that. We Amen. Can't, I, I okay. love that word, but we can't go farther than that. But thank you for that input. That's, that's tremendous. Um, we are probably out of time by now, but I, I don't want to cut off uh, any other kind of comment, I can relate to the dream that you had. I remember in Madagascar, the first dream that I had, I was a very little kid. I might have been four years old maybe by that time because we had done the studies, of, you know, language studies. And my dad and mom uh, were involved in deliverance ministry and were pushed into it. Very first night we were in Montana, the catechist came and said, Lolf, you gotta come, Pastor, you gotta come and help us. This lady is full of demons. Didn't know anything about it, hadn't studied anything about it, just read it in the Bible. And no missionary had told him that that had happened, and no other missionary seemed to know that that happens. So he did that. But I remember having a dream, and I remember as this little kid, I remember fire all around me, and the demons were all dancing. I don't even know what they looked like. And I remember crying out to God, and I, and I said, Jesus, help me, and it all disappeared. Then when we were in Victoria, I had one other dream. When you remember dreams like that, you know that they really were something. God was telling you something or Satan was doing something. Uh, but anyway, we were in Victoria, so we've been pastoring for some time. <clears throat> and the dream I had was that um, Satan was there, and I couldn't make him go away. And I remember saying, I have a Bible under my pillow, which I did not have, but that... <laughs> I have, the, I have the word of God. Didn't faze him at all. Didn't faze him at all. And I remember feeling totally desperate that if those things that I was trusting in to give me power over the devil were not going to work, I was in big, big trouble. Finally, I just said, I just said, Lord Jesus, I cannot defend myself. You are my defense. Your blood covers me. He was gone. But the impact of those encounters make you really understand that you cannot do it on your own. You're not smart enough or strong enough or old enough for that. Jesus is our life. He is our protection. Lord, I just ask as you've trusted us as this body to be prepared for your second coming and as you've told us before this, at the beginning of this year, it's time to prepare our hearts again. Oh, Father, I ask that by your Holy Spirit you will continue to keep us walking in your ways and thirst for your word that is insatiable and wisdom to discern what thought is from you and what thought is not so we do not tolerate those thoughts and become deceived. I ask for your special protection over this body, over our families, over our businesses, our jobs. Lord, wherever we step, 
we declare that it belongs to the kingdom of the Most High God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I put all this <coughs> patriotic stuff up because it's almost impossible to have a um, cross with things as big as these guys are. But I would like, if you've had anything to do with the military, if you've been in the military or police force or first responders or in your family, would you please stand? If you're standing, you're standing, you're standing. Anybody else have been in the military and, and the police? I just want to thank you. We don't have any big announcements um, in the bulletin, but we do have um, some news I'd like to ask. Paul and Rebecca and Freeman to come forward, please. Uh, Paul, Rebecca, and Freeman have been um, visiting uh, CBC and uh, they feel like it's it's time for them to leave abundant life and to plug in at CBC. So today we want to bless them and we want to release them. So anybody who'd like to come forward, please, and, and pray over them, now's the time to do that. Father, thank you for Paul and Freeman and Rebecca. They've been and are an important part of our family. Thank you for blessing them. Thank you for how they have grown in you. Thank you for their hearts. Lord Jesus, we, we bless them. Yes. We ask that you would watch over them, that you would prosper them greatly, yes. that they would walk in your ways that you would guide them to do the things that you would have them do. And that the enemy would not be able to stand against them all of their life. Just bless them in your name, Lord Jesus. And thank you for them. The Lord intends to bless you and make you a blessing wherever you go. The Lord says that he will enlarge you. He will enlarge your steps under you. He will enlarge your authority. He will enlarge and bless you so that those blessings can flow through you like a funnel to those who need them. We do bless you. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that you've prepared a place for each one. I thank you for your direction for them. Paul, Rebecca, Frida, Freeman, to a new place. I just pray that you will make their footsteps secure that you will establish them in your place in a new season for each one of them, that you will bless them indeed, and that goodness and mercy will overtake them. Lord, we just thank you for their youthful spirit, that they love the Bible and yes. follow the Holy Spirit. And so we just pray that they'll be a blessed by <clears throat> Community Bible Church and there'll be a blessing to those around them yes. at the church. Thank you, 
You are family. You're always welcome. Don't don't see strangers. In fact, I'm already planning on how to get you back for October Gold. <laughs> All right. Why don't we stand for the closing? May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May He send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing song. <clears throat>